everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, it is my pleasure to sit here with two good longtime friends to be able to just chat. Right. So uh, if you don't know, I am Larry Whiteside Jr. I'm the CISO of RegScale. Um, uh, we are a compliance automation tool, GRC tool. You can call us whatever you want. Just we do a lot of fun stuff. Uh, with me, I've got two close friends. I'll let them introduce themselves. Carl. Hey, Larry. Great to see you again. Uh, Carl Matson. I'm the CISO for No Name. We're an API security company. And uh, I've been with the company about two years after having uh, uh, several operational CISO roles in financial services and, and technology. Um, and, and James, good to see you as well. Yeah. Hey, Carl. Good to see you. And Larry, always a good time. Uh, James Christiansen. I'm uh, here at Netscope. Been here about four years. Uh, operational CISO for over 30 years with companies like Visa, General Motors, uh, Experian, et cetera. And uh, love, love what's going on in security right now. And I'm really excited about uh, today's program. Great, great, thanks. Um, and it's interesting, right, to, to know each of you and us having been operational CISOs and to see where we were and where we are now. It's been an interesting journey to, to watch and follow along. So, you know, uh, we're gonna talk about, you know, this Netscope and No Name Partnership, right? So you've partnered on several levels, right? Uh, over the years, there's a number of different things that you guys have found some synergy to partner on. How did this begin? Uh, give your perspectives on what you tackled that's very difficult and different from a security perspective. Carl? Sure. Um, so my relationship to Netscope back, goes back to, I think, 2015, 2016, meeting uh, Sanjay Berry when Netscope was a pretty small company. Um, and over the years, uh, it, as an early customer, uh, I've been a customer of Netscope for um, three different companies. I, I love the technology. I love the team. And so I, over the course of years, I knew several people who were part of the Netscope team. Uh, so when I came to No Name, um, it was like this great opportunity at reach out, reaching out to those people again. And, and uh, this is this, it's a company and a group of people that I had a, a great affinity towards. Um, and I was a, kind of excited to show what we were doing at No Name. Um, and, and, and Netscope is sort of an unusually sophisticated company. The security team is pretty, pretty amazing. Um, and what, what they gave us is they gave us a really... Um, a, a really good hard lesson and, and, and sort of feedback loop, getting good feature requests and getting it, getting ourselves ready um, to, to, to have our platform successful at a, at a pretty sophisticated security company. And so it put us through exactly the right kind of paces um, that, that make us sort of market ready. Um, and so in that process, we, you know, we've, we've done everything from um, like dinners and, and field events to um, um, sort of product roadmap discussion because we take the we take the the Netscope team very seriously in terms of uh, what they need out of us um, to make our platform and it's just been a just super valuable on a bunch of different levels. Yeah, that's that's great. So so I w I want to take that same question to you, James. Right. So I know in the role that you have, you do a lot of evangelizing and talking about the value of Netscope. Right, but when you think about this partnership, right, and when you think about what No Name does and the problem that they solve, how, how do you feel that that partnership has brought value to you guys from a Netscope perspective? Oh, absolutely, Larry. Great, great question. And you know, as I think about my relationship with No Name, it goes all the way back to when the the founders were just trying to define the problem, and I was able to meet with them, talk with them about their vision, and really start giving feedback. As as Carl said from day one. And, and what I loved about the executive team at, at No Name is their, their ability and willingness to accept that feedback and use that feedback to drive real requirements back into the application and really keep that feedback loop going all the time. So it's been great. And you know, as a practitioner for so many years, APIs have always been that area that I think was a, a huge risk. And as we're looking forward, I know we're going to talk about some trends we're seeing coming forward, but interaction between applications is key to making any of these things happen. So sort of like without security, you can't go fast. Without API security, you can not enable really the platforms we need to be able to move forward as an organization to bring the sort of the cost effectiveness that we need to as, as security practitioners. So it's absolutely essential that you, know, you use like no name to get your, your API security. I think that's where we're really strong together is being able to bring these, these platforms together. I, I love that. And, you know, at Rexcale, we are 
working towards. We're a lot younger than both of you guys from a from a platform standpoint, but but as we grow, we're, we were built on API, so we recognize the value of it. So both of your companies are huge strategic partners for us that, that we look forward to growing with. I want to ask a, a little bit of a curveball question here related to this, uh, because it's come up in a lot of dialogues, and that's around the definition of an asset. Um, you guys both understand the importance of APIs. Um, are you guys starting to hear people talk about APIs as assets, like I am from people? How is that changing the narrative of where we're going from an industry where we still haven't really gotten the whole define our assets and identify the assets that we have in our environment well? What, what are you guys seeing out there? Is this a trend? Is this, and this is this is trend that should be happening more. I think so. And I think that the, the distinction of an API being an asset has a couple of very positive implications. So if you go back in time to the even three years ago and five years ago, the way that we protect and defended APIs was to maybe put them behind a web application firewall, or a simple penetration test prior to production. And those things are good, um, but they're kind of point in time or there's, they're, there's, they're very limited in what they can do. When we look at, when we call an API an asset, what we're, what we're, what we're accepting is the, is the premise that this is an asset that has an entire life cycle. It has to be designed well, has to be developed well, has to be tested well, it has to be managed and configured like a like a like an any any endpoint would. It needs run prime protection and it has users who use it. And there's behaviors that we can see by looking at the, the behavior of the API. So when you take an expansive view in the API and we look at the control plane, um, there there are historically a, a great number of those asset lifecycle gaps when it comes to an API. Uh, it, it isn't enough just to protect it from a couple of things at a couple of points in time. We have to look at it um, from sort of cradle to the grave set management perspective. You know, and I think about it as an asset, you know, one of the things in risk management, you can't manage risk you don't know about. If you don't understand your APIs, where they are, what they're doing, like any other asset, you need to be able to do that to be able to manage the risk of those. It's absolutely essential. Got it. So, so let's, let's get our crystal balls out, right? And this happens all the time. We always pontificate on what we see the future being. But if you think two to three years out, right, um, what's the future of data and network security, right? What's new usage trends, patterns? Is there anything that you're seeing starting to emerge that's not common practice today? And how are your companies staying ahead of those trends? Yeah, great question, Larry. And let me take that one first, Carl. You know, the I think right now we're seeing sort of what I would think of as the, the perfect storm. We've got, you know, one side business digitalization, driving quick changes. Organizations are changing more rapidly in their business operations than we've ever seen in the history uh, of the US or actually probably uh, mankind. And we're seeing the sophistication of threats go along with those. And I know we're gonna talk about some of those today. So you've got, you know, business digitalization driving business change. You've got sophisticated threats, you've got the great resignation, and of course the layoffs that are part of our you know, tight economic times or recessionary pressures. All these are driving data, and, and data is moving more massively than ever. We see so much data sprawl today. And think about that as a practitioner, what that does to your tax service. So you've got this changing things, a lot of things changing, which change is always gonna lead to you know, sort of security risks, right? You've got this idea of the, you know, the massive movement of data that's creating the, the sprawl. We don't have data centers anymore like we used to. I, I used to think that was tough to secure. Now we've got centers of data all over the place, right? So that makes it more difficult on us to, to manage the security of. We have limited resources you know, that we've got to go after. You know, we still don't have too many people. I've never met a security guy yet that said, I've got too many people. <laughs> we've got, yeah, regulations. I mean, regulations and compliance, they just keep coming at us and more and more as more organizations, rightfully so, are looking at privacy and, and the ways we've got to go through there. We've got the you know, data versus performance issues, you know, the security versus performance and how do we find that right balance and the ability for business agility, you know, how fast can, can companies change? How do we enable that? And I think we'll probably talk about that a little bit more, but you know, we start thinking about business value and the agility that we bring forward in security. You know, these are really drivers, I think, that, that what I'm seeing is a really big trend is network and security folks working more closely together. 
I came up through IT. I was a you know, programmer, then a systems programmer, and then I ran CIO and ran large scale networks. And that's what I was doing at Visa when I first moved over into security. And there's always been, you know, every place I've been, there's sort of this tension between the, the network team and the security team. You know, firewall, who owns the firewall? No, I own it, it's a security device. No, I own it, it's a network device. You know, there's always been this sort of idyllic uh, who owns the things and that tension. But I think we're at a point now that we're seeing this trend, we're seeing that we've got to work together with edge security and SASE and some of the things we're seeing emerge here. It's absolutely essential for our organizations that are going to be successful to work together. You know, the CIO is sometimes I never reported to a CIO in my career. I was always in a separate group, but I always had a symbiotic relationship. We needed each other to be successful. And so we worked very closely together. And I think that's got to be the current trend to be successful, bigger, better CISOs. I was, I'm a golfer and I'm not a very good golfer. So my pro, he never says you hit that shot lousy. He always says, you know, better golfers hit it this way. And I like that term. I always say better, better CISOs are really working closely to bring those teams together, to get common goals, to not have these conflicting priorities that, that I think have generated a lot of the, you know, the friction between groups today. We're seeing a lot of, you know, and I think we'll probably talk a little bit more about, you know, vendor consolidation. I'm seeing that a lot. It's a lot of the conversations I'm in is how do I reduce my costs? And I think we'll kind of come back to that a little bit. Complexity. Do you know that on average, the average organization's managing over 76 security products. I think I've installed 700 of them, I'm sure, in my career. And I'm sure you guys have as well. But when you think about the complexity that brings, what does complexity bring? It brings errors. It brings human error. We see human errors as the number one cause of breaches. And that's what this complexity we've driven in. And, and I think about, you know, where are we going to be able to move as we move forward and how do we reduce that? And, and again, we'll probably talk about that a little bit more as we go through today. You know, can't say, you can't have a conference day without talking about generative AI. I mean, it's every conversation in every conference I've been at since RSA, a big topic at RSA, of course. You know, at Netscope, we, we see, you know, I think 40 billion plus transactions a day. So we're able to see trends. We're seeing 20% growth month over month in generative AI usage. About 1% of all employees are now using it. So across the globe. So it's a huge demand, a huge sort of trend we're seeing. And it's something that I think we're going to really have to look closely at. You know, SASE is another thing that I think, you know, we're seeing two to three years out, but it's been around since 2018, 2019, the, the framework. But I think we're seeing true adoption now and, and true providers being able to do like Netscope, a full SASE platform. And that's going to address a lot of these issues that, that we talked about earlier. And, uh, you know, the other key, key area I see just, and it was all over RSA was uh, zero trust, you know, definition of zero trust is I think the hardest thing we're gonna, we're gonna be able to look at is how do we define zero trust? You know, it's beyond ZTNA, you know, what, what is zero trust? Well, it starts with the assumption you can't trust anything, you can't trust your application because we're running SaaS applications, you didn't write it, you can't, you haven't pen tested it, you're not threat modeling it. You've got a network you're running across, you don't control, you're going across cloud, cloud technologies, you don't have the control of. You know, you're, you're using endpoints now that passively are bring your own endpoints that you didn't create, you don't have your configuration on, whether it be a, a laptop or a PDA or a, a um, tabletop system. You know, so we've got all these systems we, we don't trust, but we've got to build that trust. And when I think about building trust, I, I don't really like the term zero trust, uh, mainly because I'm an executive and I go to my 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 executive board or the board and I say, hey, we're, we're working on the zero trust you know, initiative. And, and what they'll do is they'll look at me and go, oh, he's a scared guy, he doesn't trust anybody. And that's not the reaction I want. So I talk about adaptive trust. And when I say adaptive trust, they'll say, hmm, what's that? What do you mean adaptive trust? And we're able to talk about how we, we are able to enable the business to go further, to be able to do things when previous lives we'd had to deny because we can build more trust by getting the telemetry that we understand about these things. So. So do you have trust? And as I said in our opener, APIs enable all this. And I think that's where no-name security comes in, is the ability to secure the APIs, to be able to make these subsystems be a cohesive security platform. And, and without that, none of this would be possible. With that, Larry, I'll, I'll turn it back to you and Carl. 
Great. So, so you dropped a lot of nuggets in there, right? Um, uh, Carl, from a trend standpoint, anything you want to jump on? I got a lot of things that I'm going to like dive in on, but I want to give you a chance to jump on some, some trends you're seeing. Yeah. I mean, James, you've, you've covered a lot of rich territory there. Uh, I mean, the, maybe the one thing I, I would add to it is uh, the, this trust equation and how we relate to our third parties. And so um, I can think back six, seven years and the, the, the concept that prompted me to even look at Netscope was the concept of shadow IT, right? Looking at identifying the use of SaaS that businesses were using that were unknown to the security team. Um, fast forward to today, uh, looking at business use of IT as shadow is, is self-defeating. Uh, what I need to be doing is I need to be enabling that. And I need to be enabling the business users to use SaaS applications securely. So I need to flip my perspective as a security professional to be an enabler rather than a blocker. And I think that the other level of that right now is exactly this, this use of um, like what's called the citizen, the citizen developer uh, who is looking at um, capitalizing on capabilities for, let's say, open AI or, or a variety of different services um, where the, the citizen developer can do a lot of damage uh, if, if, if we don't give them the tools uh, to be resourceful securely, uh, because I think the I think the horse has left the stable in terms of the business user community having the um, feeling the prerogative to go to go out there to go shopping to go test to go develop um, outside of IT outside of security, um, and we're not going to get we're not going to reel that back. What we need to be is we need to be in front of that user, giving them secure technologies that allow them to um, to be in a secure compute environment uh, from the get-go and allow them a, a, a lot of latitude, but knowing that uh, the, that to the telemetry, the visibility, is, are, those are things that we can do as a security program um, behind the scenes that's not saying no, but it's giving some guardrails and, 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 and getting to yes faster. Yeah. So Kelly's the horse left the stable. He's down the street, gone around the yep. corner. <laughs> and, you know, so so uh, a couple of things. Sure, I called uh, Larry. Okay. Quickly, quickly, talk about another stat. You know, we see over 800 applications, SaaS applications, average environment, and IT managing about 10, 20 percent of those. So we definitely, I think that's why we went to the term business digitalization. We gave up on shadow IT. We we had to embrace it, and I think shadow IT. We just gave up and we said, okay, we're going to call it business digitalization. Embrace it, make it positive about it. I think is is a great idea, Carl. Well, well, so, but, but it's interesting, right? So, so I want to, there's so much that both of you put out there, but there's a very interesting fact that I want to dive into, and that is mindset. So, so Carl, you go to what you started to was the mindset of no is what security used to be and how everybody thought of security, right? James, you even alluded to it, starting with the, the term zero, right? When you talk about trust, automatically says, well, of course, you're a security guy. You don't trust anything. You don't want us to be able to do anything. But with this shadow IT concept, when it first started, all security professionals were really like, we got to get our rails around this. They're using too much. They're doing things that aren't approved. They're doing, right? They're doing things. But the reality is most of the successful businesses that exist in the globe are ones who enable free thinkers. They want free thinkers and they enable them, right? With all the innovation that we've had over the last 30, 40, 50 years, it's because people have been allowed to think outside the box and go attempt things, right? And so with us from a security standpoint, we unfortunately started in the mindset of, okay, we got to live within this. Instead of figuring out, hey, how do we allow them to be more open? So Carl, to your mindset, if we've been able to change our mindset to be more open about this whole aspect of shadow IT is not now shadow IT, we want to be technology enablers securely. How do we, if we take that same mindset forward for AI and generative AI and all the things that that brings, that can open our industry up to trying to figure out more ways to enable the businesses to continue to do what they do. But my challenge is this, all of this still comes back down to relationship, right? James, you started talking about this relationship between IT and security, right? Um, add to that the relationship, relationship between business and security. What are the things that, that you guys, longtime practitioners as, as am I, what are the things that you share and you, that you've done to better change your own mindsets 
and work with those partners better? Because I think that's something that a lot of CISOs, because there's no real great CISO training on these aspects of being a CISO. So what have you guys done and what did you do to sort of change your mindset? And James, you talked to a lot of CISOs about this. What are the things that you're sharing with them to change their mindset and wrap their head around being different in that way? Yeah, you know, embracing the business. And, and I, I used to tell my security team, take no out of your vocabulary. Go to yes, but. Now, sometimes that but, you know, yes, you want to do this, but we need to do this, this, and this. Now, not all the ideas are great ideas, even from the business. And they may see that when they see the things they need to do to, to enable what they want to do. But like I said, it's a different mindset. You know, one of the things that I always felt really strongly about as a CISO is being absolutely engaged in the business, understanding, you know, what, what the company does to make money, you know, how, what makes us unique, what, how do we, the three R's kind of touch, and, and, you know, I'd always sit down with the exec team in my first week to kind of go through, because they'll give me your honest perspective of how they see security. After that, you know, it's kind of your program, they may be a little more reserved, although execs usually aren't very reserved when it comes to giving their opinions, but I'd also on an ongoing basis, get at their staff meetings. Why were at their staff meetings? I'd understand where their pressures are, what their object, uh, objectives are. I'll sit down, I did a lot of uh, security program strategy reviews with CISO. So I'd come in, look at their security program strategy, interview the things. The first thing I'd ask the CISO is what are the three main objectives your C CEO has laid out this year for growth? And you'd be shocked how many don't know. How do you not know where your organization is trying to grow because you've got to tie your security program to that. You absolutely have to be aligned with that. You've got to be aligned to enable that business to understand where your new risks are, understand where they're going and how you need to prepare for it to be more agile. So I, I think, you know, the best coaching I've given CISO is get engaged with your business, understand your culture. If you, you're in a culture that's very risk adverse, great, put in a lot of controls. If you're in a culture that's very risk accepting, you better understand that because if you start to put in a lot of controls, you're going to bang heads, right? And you need to create right. that trust with the exec team. So they trust you when you say, we need to do this versus, you know, we need to scare everything. We need to lock everything down. Disable login. It's our biggest risk. I think that's where we've got to move that, that idea of, yes, here's how we get there. Right. Uh, and and I'd, I'd add to that. I don't think that establishing trust with business executives is rocket science. Um, I think it's as simple as um, uh, you know, whether you're newly joining a role or you've been there a while, um, set up 15 minutes with a, with a line of business head and ask that, that executive, like what you, you can do, what, what, what can I do to make your life easier? And, and probably the answer is something like, um, oh, I have users who are waiting for access to the system. Yeah. That's easy to fix. Um, or things like, you know, we used to use this technology, but IT told us no. Okay, maybe that's something that you can go back to the CTO and the CIO and take care of that. Um, but it, putting a win on the board for a business team like that, that's a tactical win to them is a big deal and to a security team might be super easy. Um, so I think as it just as a, as a technique goes, um, every business executive probably has a thing or two about IT and security that they, if if we could change it, that would make their life easier. And those are things that as a CISO, I don't really care about. Like I can fix that. That's easy. That way, the next time the opportunity comes to be at the seat at the table, um, you're, you're invited. You're welcome because you're, you're there to be an asset to the company. You're not there to say no. You're there to be um, a value creator. And so I, I think that I think that, so I think that tactically pulling that relationship off um, can be really easy. Just just ask, like, what, what can I do? To, what can I do? Um, what can I do to make your life easier? What can I do to make your business faster? Um, and, and, and take that seriously and fix it. Um, those are usually easy things. Yeah. One of the things that, I, that I've, I've told uh, CISOs that I've mentored and coached is understand how your business leaders make money and not necessarily just in their business. You need to understand how their business unit makes money, but you should also understand how they are bonused and compensated because you're gonna quickly learn what's most valuable to them, right? Like if, if a business leader is getting compensated greatly because they are doing X, then that X is gonna be the thing that they are gonna drive really, really hard at. And so if you can figure out how to help them make X work in a secure manner, you're gonna be one of their best friends on the planet, right? So 
I want to pivot into something a little bit because uh, Carl, you started going into this. So you mentioned third-party trust, right? So when, when we think about APIs, and we just we, we go back to the whole solar winds thing and everything that's happened over the last few years in third-party trust, um, APIs are sort of centerpiece to that. Um, what are we doing? What's changed since then to make it better? Has it gotten better? What, where are organizations moving as it relates to that? And how are they continuing to govern that, govern that bit better? Um, yeah, so just like a, you know, a, a quick you know, trip back in time, let's say eight years ago, you could, you could you have your mobile banking application and use it to check your bank, bank balance. Great. Um, uh, now, most of us log into our, our, our mobile app in our bank and we get a credit score, we get the current value of our house, we get offers for you know travel rewards and all sorts of things. And each of those services now that we as consumers benefit from, those are API calls out to someone else's, to a third party. And so now any, any application, um, whether it's e-commerce or banking or you know, like the grocery store. Um, that application is really a cluster of API calls out to third parties. And so what we're really seeing is we're seeing like an exponential increase in the use of the API because it's really simple. It's developer friendly. So for example, if you're a bank and you can develop, a, you know, a few lines of code that goes and gives your customers their current credit score, uh, that's good. Customers love that. That's exactly the customer experience that you want to provide. And the more... Um, you know, more technology teams see how the API can be the hero uh, of giving their customers a better experience. Um, absolutely, that explosion is going to keep continuing. And so just if you look out in the future, um, you don't have to be, um, um, you know, a genius to think like, yeah, customers are going to keep wanting more. They're going to want more services and more data available to them in their computing experience. And that's just, that means more APIs integrated. Yeah, yeah, I get it. So, so um, James, I want to come to you real quick. So, you know, the entire world is blowing up. We've got companies laying people off. We've got, you know, um, a lot of economic uncertainty, right? And we are hearing CISOs talk about budgets decreasing. They're not getting what they had. And companies, right, are just not buying. And you, you had talked about the sheer number of applications that companies are running, the sheer number of security tools that, that security teams are running. What's that, what's the impact that we're seeing on the security teams that you're engaging with today, right? When you go out and you talk and you engage with these CISOs, how are they starting to deal with that? Yeah, uh, well, it is a, a, a very timely uh, topic and, and one I spend a lot of time with. You know, being a CISO for so many times, I've been through all the ups and downs in the economy uh, a couple of times, all the way back to the you know, 90s booms of, of uh, the, uh, all the internet bust and all that. So, you know, it's sort of like history tends to repeat itself. But what I'm seeing right now is um, I don't know that we're seeing the impact we had feared so far, and I'm, I'm fingers crossed on that one, right? Most of the organizations I talk with, they're very, very conservative because they don't know where it's going to go this year and, and next year. So we're seeing, you know, maybe slight increases or flat, not hearing a lot of people getting actual budget cuts in security. Other other organizations, maybe, uh, you know, we've seen some layoffs across the industry, but, but not, you know, widespread. But I think it's this uncertainty that's uh, really making organizations pause and see what they're doing. And I think, you know, again, that term better CISOs, you know, they're really looking at how do I, how do I stretch my security spend? How do I take that 76 prod products I'm trying to manage and, and get that down? Maybe I can, re I can reduce my licensing cost. Maybe I can reduce my complexity. Maybe I can actually save value. And maybe I can take those scarce resources of security staff that I do have and give them higher and better, better jobs, you know, more, more productive, more value creating jobs than applying maintenance and doing configurations all day. And I think that's where you know SASE framework, I think, is, is kind of what that's based on, is that consolidation. So I see a lot of companies going through vendor consolidation. And where I tend to personally get involved is helping the CISO think through the, the business case of doing this. It's really important for a CISO right now to communicate with the exec team on that level. Here's what I'm doing to save costs. Here's how my organization is managing the agility to enable the business to go forward. Here's how I'm generating business value, managing the risk, managing the cost, and managing that capability. And, and think about that. And think about, a lot of CISOs don't talk a lot about 
how they're enabling the business. They talk about controls and compliance and things that, you know, that the board really, you know, are glad we're here, but, but don't really get the value unless we talk about the value. So I think putting those business cases together show if I make this investment, I can then get rid of these legacy uh, options and tools and complexity. I can reallocate staff. I'm not going to lay anybody off. I don't have enough security people in that. But I can really now start to enable them to do better jobs. One of the other things I'm thinking about right now, especially with the, the great resignation and layoffs and a lot of the, the turmoil in the job market, is who are my top performers? I'd encourage every CISO to make sure they understand those are. And how am I going to retain them? Because if I lose them right now, there's a good possibility I won't be able to rehire for a while. A lot of hiring freezes out there. So if I'm not retaining my critical staff, that could be a real issue for me. So think about the CISO. Better talk about how they're optimizing that business value and they're thinking about their staff and their resources in a way they can stretch it further and use that money, by the way, that savings to fund your, your new projects versus getting incrementally more. You know, CISO is really good at you know, buying new products and we're not as good as optimizing and we never pull anything out. So I think this is the time we can start thinking about how we can do that better and stepping up and earning that quote C in our titles, the chief in, in that chief security officer. Carl. Well, I think a lot of companies feel like there's downward pressure. Um, on like, for example, budgets, but I totally agree, James, we're not really seeing anything getting cut. Security companies, our, our security departments are usually not getting budget cut because their, their staff expenses, they're, 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 we're trying to take care of our staff, we're trying to keep what we have. Um, and most companies have a couple of anchor technologies that, that they're not going anywhere. And so there's only a, a small amount of the security budget that really going into any one year is discretionary. And so if you're trying to get into companies as a new vendor, it's really hard. It feels really tight because there's just that little bit of money left over. That's really like a discretionary project kind of work. Um, but that, 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 that's, that's why I think the, the uh, chatter at the um, security company water cooler is it's really hard to get new business. And that's true. But the security budgets aren't really, aren't really going anywhere. Um, so if you're, if you're in, if you already have a, you know, a trusted security vendor, you're hanging on to those, just like you're hanging on to trusted employees and, and making sure that what does work, you're keeping, you're, 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 you're maximizing the most you can on the relationship or the, or the, the resource you have. Yeah. And James, I'm actually going to going to disagree with you a little bit, right? Because the, one, of, one of the trends I'm seeing is because of the growth in regulation, people are starting to actually now focus more on controls and saying, okay, I've got to do something to be able to demonstrate I'm meeting certain controls that align to this myriad of freaking, you know, regulations and things that I must now meet because I'm, I've got regulators coming in and hitting me, uh, you know, every month or every other month asking me all these questions with, and the third party questionnaires. Do you do these 120 things on this one questionnaire and 190 things on the next and the next customer's that got a 600 questionnaires and you're like, okay. I can't answer all these things individually. So we're seeing a lot of customers who are saying, okay, I'm picking a framework, I'm identifying how I meet all the controls in this framework, and then I'm gonna start aligning that to the myriad of things that everybody's throwing at me because regulations are going berserk right now from, from privacy regulations to now we've got new AI things that are popping on the list. It is, it is really, really getting tough for organizations to deal with. But yeah. the only thing I'd add to that, Larry, is I think we all agree that Compliance doesn't mean security, good security, but good we, we security, do. you will be compliant. So I we, tend to focus more, now I might at the operational level be thinking a lot about compliance and, and making sure I can check all the boxes, but I'm not talking about that exec team. I'll give you an example. I went into uh, Sands Corporation, the casinos and entertainment, and uh, the former CISO, or head of security, had just pounded in PCI compliance. If you use the word PCI in front of them, their eyes actually turned red. I mean, like they started glowing, heat came off their heads. So, you know, again, it's, it's something we've got to do, but I never really use that as a driver at, when I'm talking to the exec team, when I'm talking to business level. Absolutely, we've got to be compliant. We've got to be able to show compliance. GDPR was a nightmare uh, to, to show and prove process of records and all that, but, but really drive security and you will be compliant. Yeah, well, you got to pick something, right? The problem is, is people say we're got, we want to be secure, 
but a lot of people just don't even know what that means. Right, right. right? Yeah, like, even, and okay. we have so many to choose from. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's what I tell people. I'm like, pick a framework, pick a framework, any framework, it doesn't matter, pick a framework. Utilize that as your alphabet soup of how to get secure. And then, right, then you can start, you know, mouthing off and saying, oh, me right. following this framework is enabling me to meet all of these compliance things. Absolutely. Even when communicating a framework is a little bit different than compliance, but framework, like we use NIST CSF to, to report the board our maturity. And right. they, understood, they understood that framework well enough at the board, they could see our progress towards hitting the level of maturity we wanted to be at. You know, we define where we're at, where we want to get to, where we're going to get to this year. And they could actually see the progress as we implemented new, new products. And that scored a lot of points because it brought transparency to right. them in a way they could see, you know, the, the, the money we were spending, where it was going. So, so let me ask, you know, with this economic downturn um, uh, and or perceived economic downturn, because, you know, you read something and it says we've got the highest profits ever in a lot of corporate entities. So what, however you view this, um, one of the things that's happened for a long time in cyber uh, is we have struggled with best of breed versus ease of management. Right, this whole do I buy the, the 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 new hotness, right? That new thing that's supposedly solving this problem in such a unique way, coming out of you know one of the the startups, or do I go with a known trusted entity that's solving a problem for me here really well, but also does this decent enough because I can manage it more holistically and more in a more integrated fashion? Are you hearing people? going in one way versus the other now more because of the perceived economic downturn? Oh, I, I think that's one of those trends you just can't deny. I mean, we, and when I was at Visa, I mean, we had almost an unlimited budget, really. I mean, I hate to say it that way, but I could really buy anything I want. We went best of breed on everything, but then I had like 20 security products, right? It just wasn't as, now if you're a CISO, you're not thinking about going to a platform technology, you are going to fail. You cannot manage the complexity of all the best of breed products you can buy and still, still manage a security organization. You need to pick your platforms and decide, you know, when you think about like four, four core platforms, your identity management platform, your SIM and SOAR platform, your endpoint platform, and your cloud security or secure service edge platforms. Pick which platform, consolidate, move into those and go into them all in. You know, don't, don't kind of go halfway there. You won't realize the benefits. Like I said, we're really good at buying new stuff. We're not really good at, at taking old stuff out. And if right. you don't decommission the old stuff, you're not going to see that, that savings that you had, had, had thought you would get and you'd promise the organization. But yeah, I think that you just can't go best of breed on everything anymore. You, you, you've got to be responsible. You've got to think about, you're not going to get the best security if you do that, right? You're going to that complexity is going to diminish your, your security posture. So anyway, how do you feel about that, Carl? What are you, what are you seeing there? Yeah, I, though, I mean, I totally agree that the, the, the sort of the centralization, the, the platformization is, is sort of, um, you know, the, that's the smell in the air. And that's, and for economic reasons, it's a very good, it's a very good thing. It's rational that we're, you know, we're looking at basically um, protecting the same amount of real estate of an organization with, fewer complexity. The only caveat, though, that I would suggest is that I, I can think of one time in my career where I made a, a platform move, um, and it turned out to be a total disaster. And the reason was that my team was not ready and not in line with that move. And the reason was, is that we had a best of breed solution, you know, approach was three different technologies, but there were three different technologies that my team was very proficient in using. Um, going to a single platform ended up being a huge step back for everybody and frustrated everybody. And so the economics of it made sense, but, but as a practical matter, it was a dramatic reduction of productivity. Everybody was frustrated. And so my only thought is, is as we think about thinking about this platform strategy, um, I think we mostly think about it in economic terms, but I, I, I had a, 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 a scar uh, from where that did not serve my team well. Um, and so I, I would add that variable to double check uh, with your heads of security engineering and architecture that they are on board with that economic benefit and that that's all. But I think, I think you're really right on target there, Carl. You've got to lay out that roadmap. You don't just implement a platform, right? You're going to implement it a feature by feature or almost like replacement of product by product, 
you set up the framework, you know, you say, okay, I can go to take Nesco, but I'm going to move my Casby over this year. Next year, I'll do my secure web gateway. You know, I'm going to move off those legacy products. I'm going to do BLP, you know, but lay those things out. You don't just throw it all in the you know, operation at once. But being thoughtful as a, a leader, here's how we're going to lay this out roadmap. I'm going to do zero trust up front because I need rem to enable remote workers, you know, but I'm going to do, but I've got that framework in mind. I know where I want to get to. That's the shining star at the end. But I got to be really uh, conscious and, and responsible about how much I deploy and change. If anything will kill you, it's, it's too much change, too too fast. Well, yeah, and, that, yeah that's, and that's the maybe the, the I'm reading this back in, uh, change has a cost to it. Yeah. It has a human cost, it has a time, a productivity cost. And so that 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 change cost is is not something to be over right. Actually, when I'm doing business impact analysis, you know, and the, the business case stuff I talked about a little bit, one of the things we we actually document is what no decision costs as well. Yep. Yep. There's a cost to not making a decision per month in, in lost savings, right? So you actually got to put that forward because often you put decisions off, especially right now with uncertainty. They say, well, let's hunt this down the road a couple months, but that has a cost to it as well. Yeah, and it's interesting because that's the that's that unknown cost though that you typically don't factor in. So many people focus on the printed cost of dollars and cents, and they don't see the impact of the people. They don't think about the training associated. Right? How much did you invest? You know, for them to be trained on what you do have, and now as you start pivoting, what's that investment and in training and time that is going to take to get them now up to speed on these new things? And so. Um, th those are very, very good takeaways. So I, I want to, we, we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I want to take a time and, and, you know, we just had RSA, you know, a couple of months ago um, and we were all at RSA and there's a lot going on and the full, it looks like RSA is basically back in full swing and we're back at it. Um, coming out of RSA, right? Uh, and I want to focus on the positive stuff. There's, there's always, you know, you hear a lot of negative things. Oh, RSA, everybody says the same thing. But let's focus on some positive things, right? If coming out of RSA, what are the, your takeaways, right? What are the things that you coming back out of that made you think differently um, and gave you some positive outlook on where our industry is going, both from a technology perspective and a people perspective? Well, first, first thing, Larry, you hit the you hit the head and the nail with uh, RSA, which is like it's a conference that everybody hates, but everybody loves it and has a good time too. It's a it's a we're all bipolar on that question yeah, it's uh, because like it's, yeah, it's a, a love hot hate relationship. It's, right? yeah. It is, it is, um, because I I mean I found I found this this RSA week um, to be remarkably positive. I think that number one. Um, attendance and attendance matters because what you have is you have a community of security professionals who are now back out there in the world reestablishing relationships post COVID. Um, and, and, and for all of us as professionals, um, those relationships persist oftentimes, you know, at, at multiple points in the career. And at an individual level, that's, that's like personal career resiliency is that you have a, you have a, a healthy blend of of, of peers and practitioners and partners that you engage with and that you, you can keep establishing relationships of trust that you can keep drawing on over the course of years. And so um, I think my takeaway is that we're kind of back to being human in the relationships again. And that's an overwhelmingly positive thing. And it doesn't matter where you sit on the table. Um, we're, we're all going to be each other's managers and, and employees and buyers and sellers and customers and vendors and investors at some point along the way. Yep, I agree with that. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta talk. You know, the most important thing for RSA, and I've been going to it every year for, for quite some time, even during the pandemic, is like you said, Carl. It was great to feel the energy. It was great to feel the network. I think the most important thing at, at RSA is establishing your personal network and, and keeping that alive. Because I'll tell you, you know, we always hear, you know, you need a friend by a dog in security because, but you've got to have your peers. You've got to have somebody you can call and talk to. When things aren't going the way you want them to, and you want to know what they did, and unless they trust you, they're not going to have a conversation. So if you don't know them, and you don't keep that that network alive, you're all alone, and it's a it's a lonely place out there for a chief security officer. So I really think it's important to keep that personal network alive. Spend the time, talk with vendors, talk with your colleagues, get to know what's going on in the industry. And I, I attend some of the sessions, but I, I frankly spend more time talking with uh, the vendors that are there and also my peers that are there. 
Yeah, I, I would agree with that. For me, one of the one of the things that I really, really enjoyed seeing was the increase in diversity. I, I think I saw more women there this year than I ever have engaging, participating, and in, in you know, on stage and the like. And so the diversity that I've seen and the diversity of thought that RSA is now allowed to shine and be in the forefront on stage and a lot of talks and different things was was very, very big for me, um, just being able to see that, right? And and I'll, I'll pull through on what you both said about the camaraderie that is built through community. I tell everybody all the time, like your community matters. If, and, you know, a lot of people think cyber people are all introverts because they're deeply technical. But the reality is we've, as small as our community is as a whole from a cyber perspective in the overall tech ecosystem, it's actually rather big from the standpoint when you start thinking about the reach that you can potentially have if you start building a community. And I think for me, community is probably the biggest and most important thing that any cyber person can have in their career. Before certifications, before you know any of the other stuff, it's building a community of trusted people that they can network with, talk with, share with, right, uh, argue with, right, have it and you know have differences of opinions, but learn from because we've all got different experiences and different things that we bring to the table uh, based on what we're dealing with on a daily basis in our organizations. So my last question is this. Um, and I tend to ask this uh, on every podcast or, or stage or whatever that I'm on when I'm moderating a panel. Um, for those people who uh, get to listen to this, what is one thing that you would want them to take away from our conversation today to make them better after listening to it? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I like that one, Larry. And, you know, I'll, I'll try to be brief, but it wouldn't be a podcast we didn't mention generative AI and, and what's going on there. I think I, I remember when the first ransomware came out and I was sitting there and I was thinking about this and I thought about the long term impact. And I remember thinking this could be bad because, you know, all the, the hacking that had been done, you know, I, I run a million investigations on all those organizations I work for and I, I got them two times. There's really two points I could actually nab the, the bad guys when they tried to exfiltrate the data. You know, we could get them then or when they put their hands out to get the money they wanted to exchange with, whether it be sell it on the open market or do a, I had a ransom back in 1989. So it's been around a long time, but they did a, a physical ransom, right? So we got them when they, they came out to get their money. With ransomware, you don't do that, right? It's gonna be encrypted. They don't exfiltrate the data, more recent ones are exfiltrating, but in the beginning they just encrypted and shut you down and then cryptocurrency. And now I'm sitting and I'm looking at our new threat and generative AI threat. And, and I'm thinking, yeah, this is gonna be interesting to, to see how this runs out. Cause there's like any tool, any tool out there, you know, even you know, atomic energy has good and it has bad, right? And generative AI can really benefit your organization. And it can really be used in, by the, the bad guys as well in a, in a really powerful way. I think it's gonna be interesting to see how this kind of folds out. You know, and at Netscope, we're right on top of this. We've, already given our customers the ability to, to enable generative AI versus I've seen a lot of CISOs just lock it down. That's like saying, let's stop water from flowing. Or in Jurassic Park, remember they said, uh, life will find a way. Uh, and I think if you try to lock down energy, it's too powerful, it will find a way. But if you embrace it and say, how can my company use it for the positives? And then we can think about you know, how, okay, we're gonna enable that and we're gonna deny everything else. Like any security problem, what is your threats? How do you feel about them? Do an acceptable use policy. Take that policy, use a product like Netscope to coach your real-time coach your user is gonna use it. Okay, you can use it. Here's the restrictions at the time they're gonna use it. You can say, hey, marketing, we're gonna let you use it because it writes content, but you know, apps dev, we don't want you uploading, downloading source code. So you can choose by department, you can choose by geolocation. You know, Europe, because of privacy laws, we're not gonna allow data to go up and down, but you know, across US, you know, more liberal will allow that. You can make all these decisions once you've decided how you're going to use it, you've communicated to your employees the acceptable use, and then got your team on board. Then use like a product like Netscope to, to enable that positive usage of it. I think that's going to be, but I'll tell you, I'm really excited to see how this thing rolls out. I've used generative AI. Man, I use it. I created a, uh, an image with it. it. cost me 15 cents. I had to wait for our creative group to, you know, like four days to create me a little icon thing. 
man, 15 cents, I was there. I'm, a, I'm an AI user. <laughs> Love it. Carl? Um, I, I think you know, using generative AI as the, as the use case, this is, this is the reason for us to go back to this concept of third-party risk management. Take an expansive view of the word third-party. It is end users using SaaS. It's SaaS to SaaS communication. It's our developers utilizing SaaS services. It's our production environments that are communicating with third-party services. Dedicated B2B circuits, all the above. But if this, this, this use case of using generative AI is super important. And I think it's like a, it's, it's time to modernize what we look to as what, what is our third party, what does our third party surface look like? And, and use this as an opportunity to refresh that, refresh the policy, refresh the, the control plane, um, refresh the inventories, uh, third party APIs or, or end users or developers. Yes, all of the above. And I think this is, this is what it prompts me to do is to go back to the fundamentals because the, the third party risk um, uh, context that we brought to the table a couple of years ago, this is kind of an in-betweener. And so we have to, we have to, we have to modernize what we think of as third-party risk. Yeah. So, so I, I agree with both of you. I think generative AI is here to stay and similar to the topic that you both brought up earlier of shadow IT and, and telling, you know, our business users, no, you can't. It's another opportunity for us to change our mindset, think differently um, and figure out how to enable them properly. Right. Um, I do anticipate there to be some, you know, new controls around generative AI, new best practices and a number of different things on how we can best not just utilize it internally, but secure it internally. Right. And, and secure it uh, for those public versions of it that we want to do. So um, I, I agree, as well as the third party piece, third party risk is going to continue to be redefined over and over. Um, right, with, with software and S-bombs and all of this coming into play over the last, you know, three years, uh, third-party risk is going to continue to be a game changer because I, I like to say this phrase, if you lie with dogs, you get fleas, right? And so um, <laughs> it's important to understand your overall ecosystem. Uh, but I, I will leave everybody with, with all of the advancements in technology, generative AI, third-party risk, API security, uh, you name it. We as a practice still have to focus on doing some basic things right. And, and I think we need to continue to remember those basic things, know what you have, know where it's at and know who has access to it. If you focus on some of those basic principles, all of these other things will begin to come into play and be easier to do. But we sometimes tend to try and jump forward 10 steps and we haven't taken the first two and so, uh, security is a it's it's a long race, but it's definitely not a long jump. <laughs> You're not going to start from block one and be able to jump 100 yards forward by implementing amazing technology to solve all your problems. If you still haven't done some of these basic things, you are still going to have those basic problems. So, uh, Carl, I want to thank you. James, I want to thank you. As always, it was a great conversation with both of you. I look forward to us being able to do this again sometime soon. Yeah, For everybody I got to who came to join. Thank you. Yeah, hey, um, talking with you guys. I learned something every time I talk with you guys. So I'm still I'm still learning uh, security uh, after 30 something years. So great talking with you guys. Always enjoy it. All right. Thanks, Larry, James. Great to see you. Yeah, good seeing you.